Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dean Williams, professor in the Department of Biology at Texas Christian University, located in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Williams' research is focused on using molecular techniques to help inform the management of pests and species of conservation concerns. His lab at TCU is focused on several projects. Today, he will present his research on understanding the population structure and dispersal of Texas horned lizards. Dr. Williams has a PhD in ecology from Purdue University, a master's in biology from University of Alabama, and a BA with honors in biology from Coe College. So welcome, Dr. Williams. Okay, hi everyone. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me today. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, start the talk, share screen here, I guess. Okay, so today I wanna to talk to you about um, a project that we've had going now for, for a while, and that's the uh, looking at Texas horn lizards living in a couple of small towns in South Texas. So, you know, as most of you are aware, uh, Texas horn lizards have declined or disappeared in a lot of areas in Texas, especially uh, the eastern part. Uh, this is the historical distribution. Um, these were from vouchered specimens. So, you know, there probably were horn lizards in some of these areas, but they just didn't have collections from them. Uh, and then these are the areas where, you know, currently uh, they pretty much disappeared. Uh, pretty much east of the I-35 uh, corridor for the most part, except for a few isolated uh, little populations. And the reasons for this decline are complex. Uh, probably the big one is just loss of suitable habitat. So urbanization and agricultural activity um, has reduced uh, their habitat in a lot of places. Uh, another possibility is the introduction of uh, red fire ants. Uh, those uh, are highly predatory uh, and so probably have predated on baby horn lizards or hatchlings uh, as well as eggs. Uh, and uh, they may in some cases outcompete harvester ants, uh, which are the main food source for horn lizards. And so, you know, once they lose those, uh, then they may disappear from an area. Uh, in the past, there may have been problems with overcollecting and so on. Uh, that probably is not so much a, a problem now. Uh, now it is probably just habitat loss and uh, fire ants. Now there are still some areas in Texas uh, where horn lizards live close by with people. Uh, this used to be pretty common in small towns throughout Texas, uh, but there are still some small towns left that actually have horn lizards in them. And so we started this project back in 2013 with kind of the overall question being, you know, why, how is it that these uh, horn lizards are hanging on uh, in these small towns, whereas they disappeared in a lot of other places? Uh, so we've worked mainly in Carn City and Kennedy. Uh, you can see these are small, you know, a little over 3,000 people uh, in each town. <clears throat> And Kennedy, of course, uh, most of you probably are familiar with this, is the horned toad capital of Texas. Um, unfortunately, of course, horned lizards have been declining there uh, recently as well. Uh, but this is uh, Kennedy's uh, claim to fame. Uh, and they've had a lot of horned lizards, uh, at least historically. So, you know, before we get started, I'd like to uh, make a few acknowledgements. So Ryan Dar uh, was a wildlife biologist with TPW, and he's now at the uh, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, but he's the one, he was stationed down in Carnes, uh, and he was the one that convinced me to go down uh, and look uh, and start studying these horn lizards that live in town. Uh, and he was, of course, influenced by uh, Wade Phelps, uh, who's I've been working with horn lizards uh, down in Kennedy for a long time. Uh, he started the Kennedy Horn Toad Club uh, and he keeps track of where they are in town and so on and he's been a great help. Uh, also want to shout out to the Hunt family. Uh, they provided me with lodging uh, every year that I've gone down there. Uh, the 505 in Kennedy has been a great place uh, to stay and to work out of. 
uh, and for funding, uh, TPW has funded some of this, uh, as well as a variety of internal grants from TCU. Okay. So today, um, you know, I've gone down there every year since 2013, but it's really been my students that have collected most of this data. And so today I'm going to be uh, presenting to you various bits and pieces of this data from all these students that you see here uh, that did this work uh, down in uh, Kennedy and Carn City. So at a very basic level, every year we go down, uh, we've set up 15 plots in Carn City and Kennedy. Each of those plots gets surveyed eight to 10 times over the summer. Uh, and we walk line transects uh, and basically look for horn lizards, uh, map all harvester ants, all fire ant mounds that we see. Uh, when we find horn lizards, uh, we capture them by hand. Uh, of course, take GPS coordinates, uh, insert a pit tag so that we can tell them apart. Although recently we've been using uh, belly spots to tell them apart. Uh, we also take a DNA sample, weigh and measure them, and recently we've also been recording temperatures uh, as we catch them. So this is kind of a, a basic thing that we do uh, every year. And then in addition to that, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the other studies uh, that we've undertaken. So this is just to give you an idea of kind of what some of our sites look like. So they're located uh, in abandoned lots, uh, in parks, uh, schoolyards like this one. This little schoolyard here actually had the highest density of horn lizards uh, that we've ever seen. We would catch close to 100 horn lizards a year in the past uh, in this uh, little school um, playground as well as the alleyway behind. Uh, and this is actually the alleyway behind. We also walk a lot of alleyways in town, uh, and those uh, com comprise some of the sites uh, as well. So this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what the basic habitat there looks like. And one of the questions that we had early on was, you know, horn lizards are highly cryptic, very hard to find, even when they're uh, plentiful. And so the question was, how do you sense something that's this cryptic? Uh, you can see here many times they bury themselves. You know, we've only, we were only able to find this one, for instance, because it had a radio tag uh, on it and we could find it because it was buried. Here's one that we just found by chance. You can see it's kind of partially buried in a flower bed here. Uh, and then of course, here's a little hatchling horn lizard. Uh, and unless those move right in front of you, you know, you never see those because they basically look like a dirt clod uh, in the soil there. So as we go through and do these line transects, what this is showing is a cumulative sampling curve of new horn lizards that we find on each survey. So this is a, a time period when we we're doing 12 uh, survey periods. So each of those 15 sites was getting done 12 times over the course of the summer. And you can see here, of course, how uh, the horn lizard uh, abundance goes up as we find more and more on these sites. You know, but once you start getting around eight, it really kind of levels off for the rest of the year. And so this kind of makes you think that, okay, maybe we have found every single horn lizard uh, in this area. Uh, now there are some other ways to calculate population size. And one of the ways people have been using for cryptic species or hard to sample species is by looking at their scat. And you can take scat, uh, extract DNA from it, and identify individual animals uh, from that DNA. And so this is used a lot to study grizzly bears, uh, you know, a lot of large carnivores it's used for because it's easier to find their scat than it is the actual animals, and you can then tell them apart doing that. And so we were interested in maybe trying this uh, in Carn City. So you can see here, a uh, number of times that we capture animals, most horn lizards are only ever captured once. You know, we rarely catch individuals more than once. Here's, uh, you know, a number of individuals, 40 were captured uh, twice, 
Uh, out here we had one individual that was captured five times. Uh, but because they're so cryptic, you know, you usually only, you only encounter each one once during a season. Now you do encounter scat a lot more than you do horn lizards. And, and what this is showing here, this is the percent of surveys where we were able to find horn lizard scat at one of those 15 sites. And this is the number of surveys where we actually detected a horn lizard or at least one at a site. And so about 60% of our surveys, we can encounter a horn lizard, uh, but about 75% of the time we, we actually see scat. Okay, so in some ways, scat is a more reliable way of telling whether or not a horn lizard uh, is actually in the area. And so here, you know, their scat is very distinctive. Uh, so, you know, compared to other lizards, uh, I would say it's a little bit easier to do this kind of a study with horn lizards just because their scat is relatively uh, easy to tell apart from other things. You have the cylinder, uh, it's jam packed with bits and pieces of ants, which you can see the bumps here, various uh, ant heads here. And then it's capped with a uric acid cap. Okay. And so what we did was we went out and we did a, a, a single sampling sweep in which we, uh, I think this was at the beginning of the year um, in June when we, when we started doing this, we would go out and we went to each site and just collected all the fresh scat, scat that looked like this, that we could find and put it in preservative. And then we took it back to the lab, we extracted DNA from it, and then we genotyped uh, those DNA samples uh, using uh, some genetic loci that we developed for horn lizards. And from that, we could tell how many different horn lizards uh, were responsible for that scat. And we were able to identify some of the ones that we had caught by hand this way. But the interesting thing was, is that we found a lot more horn lizards with this method uh, overall, what ones that we didn't know were there, uh, then we did just by catching them by hand. So, you know, here in this year, this was uh, 2015, I believe, um, these were the number of lizards that we actually caught by hand. So in Carn City, we caught 194. In Kennedy, we caught 24. Now from that scat, and this is just from a single sampling period, we found an extra 56 lizards in Carn City that we had never captured by hand or never saw. Uh, and in Kennedy, we caught an extra 14 lizards that way. So, you know, assuming that this is pretty standard year by year, it means that there's about a quarter of all lizards that we do not find at a site, even though we've searched that site anywhere between eight and 12 times uh, over the course of the summer. Okay. So, you know, to really figure out how many horn lizards are in a site, it looks like this does add uh, some significant uh, information to that. And over the years, what we found is that horn lizard density at these sites is pretty high, I mean, compared to natural areas. So this red line, here we have average lizard density. These are les lizards per hectare. These are the kind of names of our different sites. Uh, and this red line, is kind of at the upper limit of what's been recorded in natural areas. So about 10 horn lizards per hectare seems to be pretty common in natural areas. Sometimes it's less than that. And you can see that on average, some of these sites have really high densities. Uh, on average, uh, our sites are around 50 horn lizards overall. Uh, now this is in large part driven by that schoolyard that I talked about earlier. And you can see here that, you know, on average, we caught a lot of horn lizards in that one area. So this is kind of interesting. You know, how is it that uh, in these small towns, these horn lizards are existing at such high densities compared to what they uh, exist on, uh, you know, in more natural areas? Well, one of the early questions we had was, you know, how is it that these things move around in town? You know, is their dispersal or movement uh, potentially curtailed by things like roads, uh, buildings, and so on, you know, compared to kind of a more natural ranch uh, area where they might be? And so we did this two ways. Uh, first way we did was we used radio telemetry to basically follow them around 
map where they went, and then we also used uh, some genetic methods as well. Uh, so here you can see this is Ashley. Uh, this was her project. Uh, we glued and, and harnessed little uh, radio transmitters onto uh, a variety of horn lizards, and then Ashley went out every day and followed these uh, guys around and, and looked for where they were at. And I'll have to say this is a, a pretty challenging thing in town uh, because one, they of course will tend to wander into people's yards that we can't go into. Uh, metal buildings and so on bounce the signal around uh, much more so than when you're in an open area. Uh, and so it was, it was challenging, but we did get some interesting data from this. One thing we found was that in Carn City and Kennedy, they have very small home ranges. So on average, they're about 0.24 hectares. Uh, and this is, um, over here, this is a average home range size that was estimated in Chaparral uh, in the CHAP WMA. Uh, and this was uh, during the same time period as what we had for uh, Carn City and Kennedy, as well as here for Tinker Air Force Base. So you can see that in these areas, they actually have uh, larger home ranges. And Tinker Air Force Base, which is also located inside of a, a city, basically, it's a, a large natural area, but within that area, um, they actually have fairly large uh, home ranges. So in Carn City and Kennedy, their home ranges were mainly within a, whole, uh, a town block. So this top figure right here, this is pretty typical uh, of what we would see a uh, horn lizard would stay just within uh, that town block. And you can see this dark orange. This is the area where it spent 95% of its time, basically. And we did have a few that left their uh, town block and would go over to a neighboring town block like this horn lizard did here. So looking at the data, uh, very rarely, overall did the horn lizards go and cross roads to go to another block. So most of the horn lizards that we tracked over that summer, six of them, uh, actually stayed just within their uh, town block the whole time. Um, about three lizards crossed a road one time that we detected, uh, one lizard crossed two times, and one lizard actually crossed five times. So of all the points uh, basically GPS points that we took of these lizards, uh, 421, only 2% of those uh, were in an area outside of where, you know, they normally spent their, most of their time. So we also used genetics to look at this question uh, to kind of get a more kind of longer term view on how isolated or not they might be in these small towns. And one thing we find is that within town, horn lizards have very low genetic diversity. And that's what you might expect in an island situation. So here we have average allelic richness. This is just a measure of how genetically diverse uh, a particular population is. And you can see here in these green bars, these are all natural areas, WMAs, uh, state parks, and then the blue bar is Matagorda Island at BMA. And then here we have horn lizard populations in some of these small areas and small towns, Smithville, Rockdale, uh, Tinker Air Force Base, Carn City, and Kennedy. And you can see that these are much more similar to the island population than they are to these large mainland uh, protected areas. Okay, so it's very common that uh, island populations have low genetic diversity because they tend to lose it uh, by a random process called genetic drift. And this suggests that, yes, these small towns are basically acting like islands. And this is a, a, another line of data that supports that. Uh, here we have on this axis a measure of how genetically different uh, a population is from other populations. So it goes from a scale of zero to one. One is completely different. Zero is completely the same. And so if we compare how different towns are from each other, what we see is they have much higher genetic differentiation than those WMAs and state parks from each other, even though those state parks and, and WMAs are spread out over a much larger area in Texas. 
the towns actually have much higher genetic diversity or isolation, I should say, uh, at two different types of loci. This is nuclear DNA and this is mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is passed on only through the mother. Nuclear DNA is passed on through both mother and father. And we can see in both cases, there's much more structure, more isolation in the town than in natural areas. And in Kern City, that had uh, a situation where we could test this, it turns out that there's even significant genetic differentiation on either side of large roads. So here we can split up Carn City into an eastern side, a western side, and a southern side. The southern side is delimited by Highway 181 right here. And then, um, East and West are delimited by the Panamaria Maria Highway or Highway 123 right here. And so what we did was we compared horn lizards on either side of these roads to each other and asked how genetically different are they from each other. And so again, we're looking at FST over here. Um, this, just for reference, this is the average difference between WMAs and state parks. And we can see west versus east. It has low differentiation, but it's still in a statistical sense uh, significant. Uh, west versus south and east versus south, there's some pretty big differences there, even way more than what you see uh, even between different WMAs. And that, so that suggests this southern area especially is isolated from these more northern areas and most likely it's because of that highway that bisects this area. Okay. So from that study, you know, we found towns are similar to islands. They're isolated with low genetic diversity. Our urban structures, especially major roads, can curtail natural dispersal to some degree. So as you reduce dispersal, you're going to get increased genetic differentiation over time between populations because they're not being connected uh, with gene flow. And so this probably answers in part the high, you know, why there's such high densities. In part, it's because they're isolated. And so populations, of course, probably just build up naturally uh, as a result of that. Uh, of course, this is only a, a little part uh, of the story. You know, the question then comes, you know, you have all these lizards that are isolated in these different pockets of town. And the question arises, what are they eating? You know, so there are harvester ant mounds uh, in town. Harvester ants are relatively common. But, you know, studies in natural areas have shown that you need about six harvester ant mounds per lizard to sustain a single lizard. And in town, there's only about one and a half harvester ant mounds per lizard. So this would seem that there just wouldn't be enough harvester ants in these towns uh, to basically supplement all of these lizards. And so we started a project looking at uh, what their diets are in these towns. And this was uh, Rachel Alenius's project. Uh, basically, we went out and collected a whole bunch of scat again and dissected that scat. Um, Rachel spent, and a bunch of undergrads actually spent a lot of time looking under dissecting scopes and identifying the different groups of ants from their heads, different bits and pieces of other uh, insects that they ate, and so on. And we found out some pretty interesting stuff. You know, first off, um, before we go into that, you know, as most of you are aware, horn lizards are ant specialists. Uh, their morphology, their uh, behavior, everything kind of revolves around in large part this diet of ants. Now ants are a problem uh, as, a, as a main dietary item because they're, they're really not a great nutritional uh, source, you know, for, for animals. Uh, and that's because they have relatively a lot of chitin relative to uh, the stuff that the animal actually needs. And so as a result, most animals that eat ants have to eat a whole lot of ants uh, to get enough nutrition. And, you know, this has been the, the big uh, argument as to why um, horn lizards tend to eat 
uh, harvester ants more so than anything else. And that's because harvester ants are very large. And so you get more bang for your buck. They have large bodies. And as a result, there's gonna be more calories. So here we just see a, a harvester ant mound in uh, Carn City. It's a close up of these. And this is just uh, illustrative to show you that, you know, this is 60 harvester ant heads from a scat. And this is over 100 small bodied ant heads here. And so you can see that, yes, they would need to probably eat many fewer harvester ants than little ants to get enough nutrition. You know, and so there's another thing that plays into this and that, you know, eating larger things like a harvester ant probably means that you have to spend less time foraging. And that's probably beneficial because they do this out in the open a lot. That probably means they've lowered their predation risk as well. So large body ants are good from a standpoint of getting more calories, but they're also probably good because uh, you don't have to be out and exposed as long as you would as if you were eating a whole bunch of little things uh, over a longer time period. And so what do we find? Well, it turns out <clears throat> they, you know, harvester ants make up a very small percentage uh, of their total diet, only about 8% right here. And the major players are big-headed ants, uh, which are Fidoli uh, is the genus. They make up about 40%. And then also a thing called harvester termites. And I'll talk about that in a second. They make up about 34%. Uh, they'll also eat other ants as they encounter them there. Uh, they really like to eat emerging ants and termites, you know, when the uh, kings and queens are, are leaving the colonies. Those are great sources of protein, large bodied. Uh, and then there's other, you know, they'll eat a lot of sweat bees uh, that come out of the ground and so on. Uh, but the bigger things are harvester termites and big headed ants. And this is just showing you here kind of the relative size difference here. This is a harvester ant. This is the size of the big headed ant, and this is the size of the harvester termites. So in these scats, I mean, we're literally thousands of these smaller insects uh, and very few harvester ants. So what is it, what's the deal with these termites? So these termites are actually, turns out they're unique. It's they're an interesting species. Uh, we overlooked these for a long time uh, at the beginning of our study. We had no idea they were there. Uh, they belong to a group of surface foraging termites that's very common in tropical areas. Um, very rare in North America, but uh, well, uh, excluding Mexico. Mexico, they're pretty common. But there's a species that seems to be unique to South Texas right here. And it's this one, it's Cenarius. Okay. They're surface foraging, so they don't build mud tunnels and so on like what you see with the desert termites. Uh, they live underground, uh, and then when the temperature is right, it's not too hot, uh, and it's not too dry, they come out, uh, and then they basically forage on dried plant material uh, on the surface. And they're unique uh, doing this because they have to have special protection. So termites that would just be coming out on the surface would soon get attacked by ants and other things uh, and eaten, but they have these specialized soldiers here. And if you look close uh, at this video of this line, those soldiers are basically lined up along the edge of the foraging column. And the soldiers make a mix of chemicals that they spray through this nozzle that incapacitates any ants or anything that comes close to bother the foraging uh, column. And so basically, you know, and they do this in the tropics as well. Uh, they have this very kind of specialized uh, defense system uh, for foraging. Okay. And, you know, the other good thing about termites is rel even though they're smaller, they probably have pretty high nutritional value. Uh, termites are really high in protein. Uh, and so they probably are a good substitute in a lot of ways to harvester ants. Uh, they also have very little chitin on them compared to harvester ants, so they probably are easier to digest. Um, 
very little is known. All we know is that they occur in South Texas. Uh, and we're not even sure the extent of their occurrence in South Texas. Uh, they're definitely uh, in Carnes County. Uh, we know that now. Uh, there are two other, there's another species uh, of this type of termite that occurs in southern Arizona and New Mexico, I believe. Uh, but that's about as far north as these type of termites get. And what we see is, you know, in these plots, uh, if harvester ants are present, they do eat those. Uh, what this is showing is mean proportion of harvester ants eaten per site. And this is harvester ant colonies per site. And then this is normalized by the number of horn lizards at each site. And what you see is harvester ants become an increasingly larger proportion of their diet the more there are to eat. Okay, so they're in many ways kind of more opportunistic um, than we thought they would be at first uh, in that if there's not, a, you know, too many, if there's not enough harvester ants, uh, they'll spend time eating a whole bunch of little ants as well as those termites, uh, much more so than uh, harvester ants. And <laughs> this is a video that we actually took uh, the first year when we were doing radio tracking, uh, had no idea that, you know, what these termites were at the time. Uh, but, you know, we did find this horn lizard basically just sitting on that foraging column and, and eating these things. Um, at the time, we did not realize that this was kind of a unique species of a, a termite. Uh, we found this out later when we were doing the diet analysis. Uh, but the presence of these termites probably is what makes it possible for these horn lizards to be living in areas uh, that do not have a lot of harvester ants, or at least not high density of harvester ants like in the more natural areas. So, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, it, one of the reasons horn lizards probably specialize on larger bodied ants uh, is because it takes less time to forage to get enough nutrition and probably lowers their chance of predation. And so then this raised another question, and that is, you know, in town, if they're having to probably spend uh, a bunch of time eating these small ants uh, and finding these termites and eating them, shouldn't that increase their risk of predation? And horn lizards, you know, really do seem to be under heavy predation uh, pressure. Uh, in natural areas, they have less than 50% annual survival, you know, sometimes as low as 10% in some areas. Uh, they probably only live, you know, maximum lifespan, usually it's probably four years or something in the, in the wild. Uh, and they have a lot of anti-predator adaptations. You know, they're very camouflaged. Of course, they have a lot of sharp horns. Uh, they have the ability to inflate and flatten to discourage predators from swallowing them. And then, of course, they have the ability to squirt blood from behind the eye. That's a response to canids uh, that may be uh, trying to eat them as well and is distasteful to them. You know, so. This suggests as well they, that they're under heavy predation pressure. And we know there's a lot of things that eat horn lizards. You know, road runners, of course, would be a big one. Variety of mammals, raccoons, foxes, um, bobcat, and so on. A lot of snakes, uh, various birds, uh, other birds of prey as well. Now, in these towns, um, we really don't see a lot of evidence uh, of predation. Of course, predation is hard to see. Uh, we think probably a major source of mortality uh, is things like domestic cats or feral cats. There's a lot of feral cats in these towns. And then they also, of course, get run over on roads. And we do see evidence that you know, we find horn lizards that are missing feet or limbs. You know, we think it's probably, you know, lawnmowers and weed whackers basically in town that have accidentally uh, hit them. There are, you know, as I mentioned, cats. Uh, raccoons are pretty common in town, uh, as are things like possums. Of course, dogs are there that could potentially kill them, um, possibly rats. 
but one thing we don't really see are a lot of predatory birds. I mean, it's incredibly rare to see any type uh, of raptor in town, which is actually kind of surprising to me. Now we've seen roadrunners two times, and this was the second time uh, that we saw them. And the second time we saw them, this was on a, a study site uh, that was on the edge of town, one actually came in and caught a horn lizard. And you can see it caught it, and it's whacking it against this metal beam here uh, before it then takes off and flies with it. So this is with a cell phone <laughs> uh, capture there. Rarely do we see snakes that would predate them uh, in town, which has also been surprising to me. We, we found a bull snake one time. We found a coach whip one time. Uh, we have found a couple of Texas rat snakes, but that has been about it uh, in town. And since we spend so much time outside and are looking through brush and grass and so on, it is surprising we don't see more snakes. But it looks like, you know, things like roadrunners and snakes that predate them a lot in more natural areas, very rare in town, just, you know, from a qualitative uh, standpoint. And so we decided to try and test this. And one way people have tested this uh, in other systems is by making foam models of the organism and putting them out, and then looking for evidence of predation attempts on those foam models, you know, because it's very difficult to study predation otherwise. And so what we did was we made a bunch of polyurethane uh, horn uh, lizard models. This was Stevie Merkin's uh, project. This is one of the models here. This is an actual horn lizard. Uh, and we put these out at three locations uh, in Kennedy, Carn City, and then in a more natural area, the Los Sueños Ranch, which is not too far from uh, these two towns. Uh, we also put out controls. Uh, these are basically were just flat uh, foam uh, pieces. Uh, and use those to, to test to see maybe animals would just be attracted to the smell of the foam or something or pain. And um, we wanted to, to control for that. So we did this in June and August, uh, two different times. Each time they were in the field for nine days, either in the towns or uh, at the ranch. Uh, we put out 126 models uh, at each place, and then as well as uh, controls, uh, these round foam pieces. And the difference was pretty dramatic, actually. Uh, we found a lot of predation attempts on models at the ranch. Uh, and I'll show you pictures of what those look like here in a second. But, you know, there was evidence for avian predation, rodents biting them, other bites that we couldn't identify from other unknown mammals, and then other types of events that we're not sure what, what caused that. In the urban sites or the town sites, actually, only one model was ever bothered. And that's this one here, and it had some small peck marks in it. And so we're not even sure what that was. Uh, but otherwise, the models were really, they were untouched uh, during this time period. And this is just some of the models at the ranch. You know, we could tell if it was avian predation, if it had a triangular. Uh, peck mark in it. You know, these were probably roadrunners. A lot of cases would be, uh, or our guesses, or when they had the, the head de uh, decapitated from the model. These are sums with bite marks. Uh, rodents, you could tell pretty clearly because you could see the incisors and so on. Uh, but there was other things that uh, appeared to bite them. That we're not sure, what, you know, which mammals those were. And then other models that were just completely destroyed, and, and we have no idea uh, what it was that I tried to attack that model. Okay. Now the ranch uh, where this was done had very large number of potential predators and, and you would actually see these on almost a daily basis or evidence that they were there. Uh, Roadrunners are very common, a lot of different snakes, birds of prey were common, uh, coyotes and bobcats are also common uh, on that ranch. Uh, and so you know, from a qualitative standpoint, it, it looked like, you know, there were many more potential predators at the ranch area than we ever see in town. Now, this was kind of another interesting part to this study. Uh, at the beginning, the, the, the 
first round of models, what we did was all the models were painted gray to match the soils in Kennedy and in Carn City. And so, you know, of course, these models would have been pretty obvious on the red soil that occurred at the ranch. And then in August, all the models were painted red to match the uh, soil at the ranch. Now in town, again, it didn't matter whether those models were more camouflaged or more easily seen. None of the models, except for that one that I showed you, uh, got bothered. <clears throat> on the ranch, uh, models that were bit, you know, between the two time periods or unknown. Uh, there really wasn't much difference between the time periods, but there was for the models that looked like they were uh, attacked by birds. And so in the time period when the models were painted gray and they were put out at the ranch so that they didn't match those soils, we saw more attempts uh, of avian predation than we did later on in the season when they were painted red to match the soils. Uh, this would make sense because, of course, most birds are visual predators uh, in that way. Uh, and so we think that, you know, this also shows the importance of color matching uh, for horn lizards uh, against their soil type as well. Uh, the controls, it turned out, were not attacked very often, and they were only ever attacked at the ranch. Uh, but the models were attacked uh, significantly more than the controls. So that was good, uh, meaning that it didn't look like animals were just being attracted to the foam uh, or the paint, for instance. And the controls were attacked in a strange way. <laughs> so here's the control, and you can see this bite mark here. Well, it turned out that on the ranch, uh, there's a lot of, of course, cactus there and a lot of dead cactus pads on the ground and so on. And many of those cactus pads had this same kind of bite mark on them. And it turns out that's Texas tortoises. Uh, Texas tortoises would go around be eating these cactus pads. <coughs> and we think that maybe because these uh, control pieces looked kind of like cactus pads, maybe the tortoises bit into them just to see, you know, and then of course left them alone afterwards. Um, so, you know, we're not really sure if we count that as a predation attempt or not on our controls, but um, we think it might have been the tortoises doing that. Now, the one downside about using models like this is, you know, for instance, it's not going to measure predation by snakes. I mean, you know, snakes are not going to attack a foam model like that. And it also turned out cats were totally uninterested in these as well. Uh, you know, probably because they're not moving and just didn't catch cats' attention. And in town, we had actually set up some um, game cameras uh, next to these models. And you can see here, these are just two pictures of cats just walking past the model. Uh, of course, they just totally ignored it. <laughs> And so, you know, predation in town probably could, it's probably higher than what we measured with the models just because of cats. Uh, snake predation, we would guess, would be much higher at the ranch anyway, just because they're so, they're, you know, much more common than what we ever see in town. Uh, and so even with this, uh, we, we still think that in town, uh, horn lizards probably suffer less predation uh, overall than they do in a ranch uh, type situation. You know, so the fact that they're under potentially less predation pressure in town, that of course would allow them to have more time to sit there and eat a lot of small things uh, in town. Um, so, you know, why are horn lizards so common in these towns? Well, there's kind of that island effect. They're kind of isolated there. Uh, they have a high quality food source, those harvester termites, and there are some harvester ants as well. Uh, they have relatively low predation, at least some types, and that probably allows them to spend more time foraging uh, for these small food items than they could, say, in maybe a more natural area. The other thing in these small towns is, for the most part, yards and parks uh, have a lot of natural kind of scrubby vegetation. You rarely see long grass. In the areas of town where people have nice lawns, you don't see horn lizards. Uh, of course, unfortunately, this has been slowly changing over time. You know, as people uh, want to have nicer lawns uh, and 
clean up areas. Uh, basically, horn lizards tend to leave uh, when that happens. <clears throat> And one thing we've noticed over our study period uh, is that if there's an area uh, where there's been a lot of horn lizards, and if people go in and clear the vegetation from that area, so here's an alleyway here, and this is, you know, horn lizards would hang out here along uh, the edge fairly commonly, and then they come out, you know, to forage in the open and the sun and so on. This is that area after all that vegetation was cleared out, once that happens, they're just gone. You don't find them at that area anymore. The other thing we've noticed is that in these fields uh, that occur in town, you know, they get mowed maybe about twice a summer uh, when we're there, depending on how much rain there has been. Uh, but usually in the past, at least, uh, around the trunks of trees have been left this bunch of uh, vegetation, and it's usually an aqua. Uh, that's growing there. It's pretty thick. And the horn lizards love to hide out in there. That's where they spend a lot of their time rather than, of course, out in the open, except when they come out to forage and so on. When a park removes all that vegetation from around trees, we've noticed they disappear. They're just gone from that area. And so the thing we're working on now, you know, we had thought originally when we would see this. Um, you know, this happened at that small schoolyard uh, that I said where we, we catch about 100 or more horn lizards a year. Uh, one year, uh, and this was done kind of accidentally, we found out, is they went in and they sprayed all the fence rows around that uh, and cleared out vegetation from the alleyway behind. Uh, it killed off all that vegetation, and now we find at most about five horn lizards in that area. They just all disappeared after that was cleared. You know, we used to think that maybe it's because they don't have a place to hide from predators. Uh, of course, with predation levels being lower in town uh, than other areas, that doesn't seem to be as important anymore. And so what we think is probably, you know, important is that basically when that happens, it degrades the thermal environment. So of course, horn lizards don't make their own heat. They have to use the environment to regulate their internal body temperature. Uh, and it's true that horn lizards have much higher tolerances to high temperatures than a lot of other lizard species. Uh, but what we have been finding, last year we started this project, we put out an army of these little models um, that were 3D printed. And on the underside is a little hole that has a eye button uh, temperature probe uh, in it and it basically records temperature every uh, five minutes uh, and we put those out and let it record temperature over the course of the summer. Uh, and what we have found is that the temperature uh, that we record in these models very similar uh, to temperature uh, of horn lizards that are put you know that are in the same place. And so what we have found uh, is that in areas of vegetation and also when they're buried, we, we put these in, in vegetation areas and under, you know, little ways under the soil and then also just right out in the field, like, you know, where they would be if they were foraging. And we put these in areas where we've seen them before. Uh, what we find is that the vegetation areas uh, really do seem to be important because in the open areas uh, and even underground, the temperature uh, during the day often exceeds the upper critical limit uh, for horn lizards. Uh, so, you know, we've recorded temperatures between 50 to 60 degrees Celsius uh, out in the open uh, in these models. And of course that would kill a horn lizard or any other lizard that was uh, exposed to that for very long. And so, you know, our hypothesis now is that these vegetation areas are very important, probably more so from a thermoregulatory perspective uh, than from you know, a predation uh, perspective because the temperatures never get above their critical limit uh, in the vegetation, I mean, compared to out in the open or in the soil. And so they probably provide good thermal refuges um, for these lizards. And so that's something we're continuing this year. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor temperatures uh, in different areas. Uh, 
but we think that that's what's uh, going on. Okay, well, thanks. So that's it for now. And if you have any questions, um, we can go over those. We do have some questions. Uh, Janice's question was, uh, what was the time period that they were following, that they were tracking them? And in past experience, other population, I've seen them move more in early spring and fall. Yeah, so um, what we had to do with that compare, so we did this uh, end of May, beginning of June, and then also in July and also in August. Um, what we had to do in order to make that graph, um, that figure where we were comparing them to other populations, we had to normalize those for those same time periods. Because, you know, we would expect them to move around more in April, for instance, uh, it's just we couldn't get down there in April uh, because of the school year and so on. Uh, but that would be ideal is to go and track them in April and see how much they move around during that time period because, uh, you know, that's the beginning of the mating season and, and we would expect them to move around a lot more. Now, they do move around a lot in May and right at the beginning of June, but maybe not as much as a little bit earlier. Suzanne wants to know, is, would there be any biological value and would it be ethical to move lizards around to diversify the genetics? Um, it might be. Um, you know, there are some areas in town, um, you know, Kennedy, the, the problem now is that we don't, you know, we have found some, um, some reasons why they're, why they're disappearing and, and you know the removal of vegetation and so on is one of them but in kennedy for instance uh wade phelps has noticed uh that they had started to decline you know back in the 90s uh, and that decline has just kind of marched on um you know recently this last year we found one dead one in kennedy it looked like it had been hit by a lawnmower and that was it. Um, you know, of course, we'll check again this year. Uh, hopefully, there'll, there'll be some there. It, in some areas, they've declined because, um, you know, vegetation removal, uh, construction, and so on. But there are areas in town that we don't know why, really, as far as we can tell. There, there's some other reason that's also acting, and we don't know what it is. Uh, that has been causing this decline. And so, you know, in some of the smaller populate, you know, subpopulations in this area, it might be useful to add individuals in there to increase um, uh, breeding, you know, increase genetic diversity because you could get ones from surrounding ranches. But we don't know what it is, you know, with 100% what was causing their decline in the first place. And so, you know, it may, it, it might not be, it might not do anything ultimately we don't know you know it, it's possible that some of these ones like the, the southern population um, in Carn City you know it could be suffering from inbreeding depression because it's so small and isolated um, that's something we, we want to test in the future uh, and so in that case if that's the case it would help it to, to have a few added in uh, with that, we'd have to, you know, get permission from Texas Parks and Wildlife, and, and that would have to be above the board and everything. But, you know, it might work uh, by putting a few lizards from uh, outside of town in there. Um, you know, of course, translocating horn lizards in the past has never been very successful. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if that would work or not, for sure. Irene would like to know if we could get harvester ants back into areas. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anybody has tried to um, move those around and get them established. Um, you would think it could happen naturally. I mean, as long as as long as there's you know enough native grasses and stuff for the uh, harvester ants to forage on, uh, of course you know when people make manicured lawns and clear stuff out and that it reduces the vegetation that horn or the harvester ants require. And so, yeah, you might be able to if the habitat's good. I'm not sure how you would go about trying to establish them. Maybe you could. Uh, 
you know, they've been trying to do this at the zoos uh, in South Texas, right? And the San Antonio Zoo's been trying to do this, starting a colony of harvester ants there. Um, and we actually supplied them with some queens that we found emerging from uh, in Kennedy. Uh, and that has been hard. I mean, you, you would have to take the king and queen, put them together, see if they start a colony in a particular area. Okay. Deborah wants to know which category do carpenter ants fall in? Uh, carpenter ants would be a large ant. Uh, the problem is, you know, and so you would expect them to want to eat those. The problem is, is they're not very common. I mean, comparatively. And um, they're prob you know, they're often in places that horn lizards wouldn't have access to them. So, you know, we find them on trunks and fallen logs, uh, trees, things like that. And, you know, so it, it wouldn't be a, a very reliable source, probably of food for them. Gail wants to know, would there be any benefit genetic wise, because kind of same question we we're talking about, in taking horny toads from natural areas and putting them into city areas? Mm -hmm. uh, there might be. Uh, again, you know, I, I don't know for sure. Um, in part, it, it, I think it, it's going to also depend on us figuring out what it is that's causing some of their decline in the first place. Um, they seem to be pretty um, uh, sensitive to disturbance, actually. I, you know, for something, this is something that's always kind of surprised me, you know, something that was so ubiquitous, like, you know, it's probably like, in the past one of the most common lizard species in texas and you know of course the generation before me uh and even some in my generation but really the older generations remember you know picking these things up and shoot by bucketfuls almost you know i mean this was like a common story you hear everywhere and it was you know people in kennedy tell the same stories uh and for something to, that was so numerous and common it's surprising how uh, uh, to me anyway. It's surprising how sensitive they seem to have been to habitat disturbance. And so I think that, you know, bolstering populations genetically would work, uh, assuming that we could also mitigate whatever it is that's causing their declines in the first place, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Janice wants to know if there were fire ants in those towns. There are, and this is something else we're kind of interested in now. All of these sites have fire ants. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Um, they, you know, and we'll see harvester ant mounds right next to fire ant mounds. Uh, we have evidence from one year. Uh, now the fire ants are hard to, to uh, quantify because usually it's it's easier right after the rains and then you'll see those little dirt mounds you know and you can disturb them and tell if they're fire ants or not uh, but in times when it's really dry you don't see evidence of their mounds you know visual evidence uh, one thing we've tried to do that we think would work maybe is you can put little pieces of hot dog out on the ground and usually within 30 minutes if there's fire ants there, they will have found it and start tearing it apart. Um, so we, we don't have a great way of uh, quantifying how common fire ants are. Uh, one year it looked like there was a negative association between fire ant abundance and horn lizard abundance, uh, but in other years not so much. But of course it could be that we're not measuring their um, you know, how common they are, what, you know, we're not doing a good job at that, potentially. Um, so it looks like maybe there's some coexistence there uh, between horn lizards and uh, fire ants, as well as with harvester ants. Uh, we've been thinking about experiments that we could do to see if that might be the case. Uh, people have done this with fence lizards. Uh, looking at fence lizard behavior in areas uh, that have fire ants and in areas that don't. And what they have found is that in areas that have had fire ants for a long time, fence lizards have actually adapted behaviorally uh, in ways that allow them to uh, coexist with fire ants better than, than naive lizards. Uh, for instance, 
Uh, they don't let the, the uh, fire ants swarm them. They have ways of getting away from them. Uh, my big question would be, uh, you know, I would think it would be the hatchlings and the eggs that are most vulnerable. Uh, we wanted to do some maybe artificial egg uh, experiments to see how often those get predated by fire ants in some of these uh, plots. I think that would be interesting. Um, but I, yeah, I just don't know. You know, some work with the Fort Worth Zoo has suggested that if hatchlings are present in an area uh, with fire ants, the fire ants swarm them and the hatchlings don't do anything. They just sit there and get eaten by the fire ants. And you know, part of the problem is, you know, this species did not co-evolve with fire ants. And so, you know, there's really no predatory ant in Texas that's similar to fire ants in the same way. Um, and so, you know, they don't have any experience dealing with that kind of predator. And so probably just sat there, you know, normally they'll just sit in an ant pile and let ants swarm over them anyway. Uh, but usually those ants aren't trying to eat them. Um, and so it would be interesting to do some behavioral experiments uh, with adults too, to see, you know, how do they respond to fire ants in areas where fire ants have been established for a while and horn lizards have been there. And then also kind of more naive uh, horn lizards that haven't encountered fire ants before. It would, I think that would be an interesting study. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Elsa wants to know, is there any program that we could use to restore them to our ranch property in the hill country? Well, the uh, zoos are working on that. <laughs> uh, San Antonio, you know, this is, so I have another line of research that's basically doing genetic work to help uh, with the reintroduction efforts uh, by Texas Parks and Wildlife, as well as uh, Fort Worth Zoo, Dallas Zoo, and San Antonio Zoo. Uh, and right now, what they're trying to do is basically figure out the best way to introduce them, reintroduce them. Uh, and they're doing this down at Mason, uh, WMA. And, you know, in the past, releasing uh, adults uh, doesn't seem to work very well. Um, normally, you know, maybe you get one or two that survive to the next year, but what seems to be happening is you put adults out there and they all get eaten uh, very quickly. You know, maybe if you put hundreds out at a time, you know, <laughs> you, you could swamp the predator uh, community there. It's not clear if it's because <clears throat> these areas have more predators than normal or if this is just a normal part of you know horn lizards biology and it's just you put out 20 horn lizards and that's not nearly enough to you know probabilistically get um, get some that survive and, and, and reproduce um, and so now they're uh, experimenting with putting out hatchlings uh, in these areas and they have actually have had a little success in which some of those hatchlings have made it now to the next year and they're continuing to monitor those. Um, the idea is that it's going to be easier to kind of mass produce large, num large numbers of hatchlings and then you can just release those. Uh, and even though most of them probably will get predated, that some will survive and uh, hopefully be able to establish the population. Um, I've done some simulation work with that and it looks like you'd have to put out about on average 100 uh, to 300 hatchlings at a time and that that would have to be done over a period of a few years uh, to get a population established and then after that you would have to add uh, in about 25 hatchlings every two years uh, to keep the population growing until uh, it either got big enough or it reconnected with other natural populations, uh, you know, or was self-sustaining. So I think it's going to be a long-term process, probably. Uh, Mickey asks, is population density more a product of food availability than the physical size of the area? In this case, I'm guessing yes, uh, because <laughs> it, it, it seems like horn lizards aren't territorial, you know, in the sense that uh, a lot of other lizards are. Uh, when we were doing the, the home range uh, estimations and also radio tracking, you know, they overlap a lot with other horn 
episodes. Uh, and we often find them together, hanging out together too. Um, so it doesn't seem like they have exclusive home ranges uh, where you'd have, you know, territorial interactions that would keep other lizards out. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that aspect of their behavior probably allows them also to live with, you know, relatively high densities if there's enough food. Uh, Dr. Williams, I have more questions. Do you have okay. time for questions? Or? Oh, sure. Yeah, no, I'll have time. <laughs> okay. Troy wants to know, how do you account for the density of population in the school play yard <laughs> where there didn't seem like a lot of vegetation? Yeah, so that picture that I showed, I mean, not just from where I was taking the picture, the fence row that goes all, along, all around the back of that uh, has, you know, used to be, for, you know, have a lot of vegetation in it. And then there's an alleyway right next to there that also had a lot of vegetation. Um, that, as I mentioned, got all cleared out, unfortunately, and, and we think that's why they disappeared there. Uh, <clears throat> still, though, that, that does raise, we're still not 100% sure why it was so high there. Um, you know, it's possible that maybe it was a good nesting place. Um, you know, the grant, we did find evidence that they would go and dig, uh, find evidence of them digging nests in the playground gravel. Um, you know, and it could be that it was relatively well protected uh, for the young. Um, you know, I'm guessing there's something to do with nesting as to why it was so ridiculously high in that area. Okay. Um, it's really hard to find their nests though. I mean, that's, that's something that, you know, we really need to get better data on is really what is their nesting success in town and where do they put their nests? You know? You have to follow females from early in the year until they build a nest, basically. Uh, what is the closest relative to the horned toad? Uh, here in Texas, I mean, well, I mean, other than horn, other horned lizards, uh, probably the Texas spiny lizard. You know, fence lizards are the are the group that's uh, closest uh, related to horned lizards. Deborah asks if the communities are doing anything to slow the decline, such as reducing the use of insecticides or storing habitats. Well, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> uh, you know, there's of course a lot of uh, people that live there that really like the horn lizards and don't want to see them disappear. This is especially true in the older, uh, the older people that live there. Uh, we do go and talk at the local Rotary um, clubs, uh, as well as uh, council meetings and so on. And we basically tell them what we found. A lot of people do seem to be pretty interested uh, in helping them. Um, you know, it's kind of a, you know, there's a group of people that are, and then there's a group of people that just want their manicured playground and, you know, who cares about horn <laughs> So it, it, it's a hard, uh, it's a hard sell, I think, you know, because basically what you're telling people is, is have a crappy lawn and that's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let it grow up. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the crappier the lawn, the better, you know, the <laughs> it's a hard selling point. <laughs> but there are some people, I, I think you could probably, um, you know, there's a few people in town that, are into planting native vegetation and doing gardening and stuff that they've set up their yards in such a way that you find a lot of horn lizards there still. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you could, you know, as long as you don't put long grass in, uh, you could probably do a lot of natural uh, planting, landscaping and so on uh, and still have horn lizards there. You know, they, they really like things like anaqua bushes, uh, the cat's claw, things like that, you know, that they can hide under. Uh, and so if you maintain that and you didn't put in like St. Augustine or anything like that, um, I, I, you know, you could have a, a, a nice lawn and do that. And it's just a matter of kind of getting people on board with that. You know, there's a lot of people that, that do do that, but a bunch that, yeah, just, that's just not their idea of what, you know, they want to water their lawns and <laughs> have a nice green lawn. And, and Jean wants to know where do they lay their eggs? 
Um, so they'll dig a hole, the female will dig a hole uh, about eight inches, 10 inches deep, uh, and she lays her eggs in there, covers them up. Um, she'll often stay around the nest site a few days afterwards and then she leaves and uh, they come out and uh, they, they'll hatch about six weeks later and the baby horn lizards then dig their way up out of the soil and come to the surface. Um, you know, it looks like there, the nest that we found, I mean, it just, it, it can be anywhere where the soil's soft enough for the females to be able to dig into. Uh, you know, these are kind of sandy soils um, in this area of South Texas, and so it's relatively easy for the horn lizards to dig down into them, um, you know, as long as the soil hasn't been compacted uh, too much. Uh, and so we have found, we found a few nests, but not many, and they're, you know, just in all kinds of places, basically wherever the soil is, um, is soft enough for them to get into. Well, Tanya observed that if they ate all the fire ants, that people would probably want to protect them more. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that's looking through the scat. I mean, we found uh, a very, very small number of fire ants. So every once in a while they do eat them. But um, yeah, they really don't like to eat them for the most part. And, you know, and traditionally, I mean, because they don't normally eat small ants, I mean, uh, you know, if they had harvester ants, for instance, available, there wouldn't even be an incentive for them to eat the, the, the uh, mm -hmm. fire ants, as well as, you know, problems with them stinging and so on. And I think this is the last one I had. The, um, is the population in Oklahoma suffering, suffering the same fate as Texas? It ha well, oh, you mean the one at Tinker Air Force Base, or? Uh, they said uh, the horned oh. lizard in Oklahoma suffering the yeah. same fate as the population in Texas. Yeah, over in a statewide, yes. I mean, they it has also declined in a lot of places in Oklahoma, especially eastern areas, I guess, from what I've heard. Uh, and it has disappeared in a lot of areas there, too. Um, you know, some of this, of course, is probably, again, due to development. Uh, urbanization, agriculture, things like that. Uh, but there's something else going on too that, you know, it seems like, I, I, I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, Dr. Williams, I appreciate you coming to talk to us today. And we've had just, everyone's had a wonderful experience. We're getting lots of comments on your excellent presentation. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was. I, I like talking about horny toads. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we obviously had a lot of people who wanted to hear about them today, too. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you.